the U.S. had to win. Mm-hmm. Iran could tie. That yeah. was a factor. The U.S. had not only scored one goal from open play. Yeah. What did Greg Berhalter do in this game and, and sort of what was what was this 90 minutes? Yeah, the first task, and I, I really th- – I want to talk about the specifics because I thought they were very compelling. But the first task that we talked about yesterday and we have to start with today is that the United States matched or exceeded Iran's intensity. Number one, right? Based on the players they have, the ideas, they needed to match the intensity and they did and they did that, which was not a given come into this game. So looking at the specifics, when I think about what we saw today and over the three games, what has this t- team done so well? And The main thing I keep coming back to is their ability to tie together every phase of the game in that when they have the ball, they are set up in their position, in their starting positions and their decisions where to pass that if they lose it, they can get it right back. That when they defend, they are already in positions and taking on runs that when they win it, they can then transition to attack that. Yes, maybe they weren't all the way turned up in some phases. Did they create as many chances as they want? in possession no did they create as many chances as they want in transition no but the fact that all the things were tied together so that they did not have any weaknesses over these three games was really beautiful to watch and it all comes from the building blocks as we be talked about earlier the building blocks that they've added to each other that there have been windows when things did not go well there have been games when they did not play well but adding the building blocks on top of each other so then when it comes to these three games they are fully unified and prepared to move in between the phases of the game so that there absolutely are no weaknesses on the field. Yeah. The, the word process in sports has become a shibboleth or a, a curse word and everything in between because of, of, of what it meant in, in the NBA. But like if you, unless you luck into just a, absolutely generational um, group of players 15 at once uh, everything like you can't go from Kuva to this without having a process and that's what Bobby's talking about and what we saw on the field today was was that process come to life at least for 45 minutes right because with Iran playing as desperate as they were in the second half the game enters a tactics free zone against all but the very best teams in the world. But for that 45 minutes, the ability to, for me, it's what Bobby was saying about the ability to always be in possession to immediately win the ball back when you're taking a risk. That is the sign of a really well-drilled team. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like there are two signs of, I think, a really well-drilled, well-structured team. That and the ability to repeatedly create high-value chances by concerted, uh, and purposeful movement on and of and off the ball. And the U.S., you could see it. It's almost there. We have moments where they do it, including on the goal, though it, it's not always coming off. But through five halves of soccer, the defensive part of it, where it's like these guys are just in complete lockstep, and Iran had no way out. I don't think Iran came out from the whistle trying to sit back. But within four or five minutes, the U.S. had gotten so much of the ball and Reem was hitting into the pockets and Musa was turning guys every, like he's so good at checking his shoulder now, which he didn't do this time last year. Like he's always turning the right way when he receives the ball and that's driving forward and that's bringing guys in and that's allowing, I don't know if you guys, like I'm sure you did, both fullbacks were going up. Like, this was a 2-3-5 build-out. This was not a 3-2-5, right? Both fullbacks were going up, which is a change from what we saw in the first two games. And they were able to do that because they're so Mm well-drilled and they're so on the same page. Uh, And for 45 minutes, man, Iran had absolutely no answer. And with the two fullbacks going all the way up, the main adjustment to, again, tie everything together was that Weston McKinney dropped off. Yep. That he effectively joined Tyler Adams in a double pivot when they were in the progression phase, when they had set possession, trying to create chances, they dropped Weston McKinney into more of what really looked like a deep line playmaker. And I'll acknowledge that 20 minutes into the game, I was screaming at the television, Weston, this is not your role, right? I understand why you're doing it in terms of the rest defense. I understand that you want to be a position to win the ball back, but that is not where he excels picking the ball up, picking up his head and finding passes, right? He excels getting into the box. Then of course, how how does the U.S. win the game? 
it's exactly the opposite of that, which is he does pick up the ball in a deep position. He does find the perfect pass. And there are two other players on the end of it. But I thought that was a, a significant decision by Burhalter again, to change the starting positions, move the outside backs up, backs up, drop Wesson McKenney deeper, and it paid off. It also opened up that space for Musa on the right. And we know Wesson and Musa both want to play in that same space. That's just where they're comfortable. Musa played out there as a winger for a while, unfortunately for Valencia. And the ability of him, Dest, and Wea to interchange and all of them to swap off and lay off and one touch and move, it doesn't lead to a goal yet. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling it coming. But it is, I think, one of the best attributes the U.S. can put out there in terms of in the attack. And so it solved two of those issues there where you don't really have to deal with Weston and Musa being in the same area and it pulls Weston out of there and it opened that up for Musa. And it felt like that's where the goal was going to come from. Credit to Musa and Wea for recognizing the moment and everyone overloading into the center of the field on the goal. So that Dest has 50% of the field to operate against one defender and Weston hits the ball, but literally every player from the U S was on the left side of the field when that goal happens and that opens up the space for Des and Musa recognizes that and it's really good, but their entire game together was really impressive. Can we just give credit to a, a guy that I saw watching in Frisco or Dallas or wherever he was and sort of going through the, the same emotional states that we all were, which is Nico Estevez. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yunus Musa is not a slam dunk. Yeah. Hey, us is going to get him. He's, he wants to come into the program. Like, from day one, he's going to be a U.S. international guy. Like, Nico Estevez had the connections in Valencia, understood there was an opportunity, did the work, recruited. To go back to what you were saying earlier, I think it was you, Dave, about, you know, not just not just handing out caps or opportunities or saying, hey, you come in, we'll cap you, you're going to the World Cup, don't worry about it. Like, you know, Julian Green style, charlatan. I want to go back to Jurgen Klinsmann on that front. But to – have a plan to have yes, a process. You're going to take an L's today as well. Oh, let's go. Yeah. Oh, clubbing yeah, let's country today. Let's just hang all over the rim on him. <laughs> to have a process and a plan and then have the humility and sort of the human connection with these players to go to him and say, we think you're special. We think you can impact this program. We think you fit with our guys. Here is, here is what we can do for you. Come to camp. Meet the guys. Remember when he didn't play? Remember he, when he yep. was in the team yep. and he didn't play? And everybody lost their lost their. It was. Ah, <laughs> we <laughs> working blue. Nice. Hey, this, it was this Nations good. League, which would have capped him. He did not play. Then he played in the friendly. And everybody after. lost it. Greg Burrow, what are you doing? How could you not play him? You got to cap tie this guy. He understood the human aspect of this. And, and look what Yunus Musa is for this program now. The kid is 20 years old. He played two World Cup games at 19. And to have a staff, and it's not just, hey, look, look what Greg Berhalter did, but it's also to have a staff, to have an understanding, to have guys that realize, hey, this is how we're doing it. This is what, this is where this, this is where the winds are taking us. Let's do it the right way and rewards will come. Man, that is the, we get to watch Yunus Musa in red, white, and blue for probably a decade plus now. And Yunus to provide this. Uh, it just, God, it boggles the mind. I do want to, the, the, the quick background there is that Nico Estevez worked at Valencia before he came to the U.S. and Yunus Musa plays at Valencia. So that was the connection there. And he was the main recruiter that got Yunus Musa into the team. I thought the second defining trait for the U.S. was the starting position, the starting spots in possession, which was the outside backs higher and Weston McKinney drop in. I thought the bravery and what really looked like intentionality for the three midfielders to play through each other and keep yes. the ball central was a key part of this game because one of, one of my uh, strong hypotheses about soccer, that's really hard to prove is that the more you can connect through the middle, the better off you are because a you obviously the goal is in the middle of the field. So if you can drive through there, you're in a good position, but B if you lose the ball, you're often in good spots to win it back. It just takes the guts to play those balls between the lines or to play an up and a bounce when you're under pressure. But that's what we saw today. And the decisiveness from Tyler Adams to get the ball, get on the half turn and not play wide, not play into the depth, but to play to another center midfielder and drive forward through the middle on the ground, through the lines gave the U S another element of control today. And it's really a trait that the team has struggled at over the years. And the fact that they put it together, that they made it a main emphasis today of all days stood out for me in over the 90 minutes.
Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I give some credit there on Sargent as well of holding, I think, a defensive midfielder and center backs where they could play vertical through that space, which, as you said, it's not something we ever really see the U.S. do. Also, uh, there's a moment where early on in the game where the U.S. is pushing a little and Tyler comes and counter presses and deflects a ball off to the corner that Jedi chases down. Mm-hmm who had a struggle today. And I also thought struggled at times against England, but that's another conversation. Uh, And that's where I feel like you get so much confidence for the other guys to say, yeah, I can take risks because we are counter pressing. Our team is playing high and we're all there around us. Um, Anything else specific about this game before I go somewhere else? Well, you got to talk the second half. Okay, do it. We got to talk like the game got away from the U S by about the 65th minute mark. And this is where I'm a little frustrated because I, I like I'm like Bobby. I like proactive subs. I like, you know, if if you're not controlling the game anymore, you have to figure out what's going on with that. And I thought that Burhalter held on, like put, put him in his pocket for too long. And maybe part of that was Aronson having to come on for Pulisic at halftime. But that's like that's a thing now. Every time Aronson comes in the game, the game gets stretched. And there's not been an adjustment that I've seen from that. Now, I'm I'm picking nits here because even with that, Iran, who's a good team, by the way, like this is not, you know, the U.S. didn't just smack Honduras. Like this is a, this is a, like this is a World Cup caliber team. Or Algeria in 2010, by the way. That was not a good team. This is a good team. This is a good team. Um, Like they didn't have any of the game until the start of the second half, maybe about the 50th minute and then the game started getting away from the u.s and there was the gap constantly between the front line and the midfield and it started asking more and more of mckenney who's clearly not 100 percent, and it started asking more and more of musa who as great as he is and i agree with everything we've seen he's he's my favorite player in the pool Yunus musa is my favorite player in the pool he does not have you know Frankie Haydick or Landon Donovan or Michael Bradley style stamina at this point in his career. He doesn't certainly does not have Tyler Adams style stamina. So with those two guys, um, McKenney and Musa getting a little bit disconnected from the front line, that's where the U S lost control of the game. Now they were still good enough defensively, Tim Ream, uh, Tyler Carter Vickers, I thought had a good game. They and and honestly, both fullbacks. Even though I agree with you, Jedi has not had a good game attacking so far. He In never, yeah. yeah, he never stops grinding defensively. Um, it, they like they those guys scrambled well enough to cut off any potentially um, profitable Iranian attack. Um, but like, it was a different style of game because of that gap between the front line and the midfield. And I, I needed to see Burhalter address that. And he never really did until they went with five at the back and said, okay, we're going to be the team that's playing in the shell. Um, at which point it would just became the Walker Zimmerman show where he must've won 15 He's, headers in the last. Can, can you say that again, game. Matt? Can you summarize that again on what part you thought they should have adjusted? So when Aronson comes in and part of it is Aronson, just like, he's going to press everything. He, he, he like, what is it? He's plays like he's being chased by a swarm of bees. Um, like he, he, like he, like he does not naturally form connections with the midfield behind him. He's not that type of player. Whereas Pulisic, even when he's playing as a runner, which is what he was today, not a playmaker, he still is aware of the connections, especially defensively, um, with the midfield behind him. Aronson does not do that. And then suddenly you get the center forward saying like, oh, he's pressed. I, I'll go up and press too. And then the weak side winger is like, oh, well, they're they're up. I'm going to come inside and I'm going to go up a little bit as well. And between that and McKenney and Musa maybe you know running out of gas or in Weston's case, clearly feeling his injury, there became a disconnect between the front line and the central midfield. And that's when... Iran started getting more of the ball in good spots and it became less about rest defense for the U S and more about active defense and not smothering fires before they start, but putting out fires as they're happening. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense to you? Does does that jive with what you saw? I'm not sure it jives exactly, but I'm glad you brought it up. 
Have we discussed, I mean, you said the Walker Zimmerman part, and I realized I don't think we've discussed sort of the lineup decision by Greg to start CCV over Walker. Stu Holden I thought that, I thought that was a big, I thought it was a big gamble. It was a huge gamble. And Stu Holden talked about it on the broadcast. He said, like, this is, this was a, in a like a, a in attacking decision because um, Cameron Carter Vickers plays for Celtic in the Scottish League. He faces a bunker every single week. Every single week, unless they're playing Rangers. And honestly, the last 10 years, if they're playing Rangers too, they face a bunker. Um, and so he just has muscle memory playing against a team like that. Like when he gets the ball, when they, and we saw it a half dozen times, at least in the first half, the U.S. are recycling the ball possession on the left side between Ream and Robinson and Weston McKenney because he played on the left side of that three man midfield, which we have not seen recently. Um, they're recycling, like holding possession over there. And they play it out to, to Carter Vickers, and he has an acre in front of him. He's taking that space. Like, that is just what his training is for club, and he applied it for country. Obviously, Nashville do not play like that. Nashville are the team that play in the bunker. They're not the team that faces the bunker. So, and that, like, Stu said that on the broadcast in, very like, many fewer words than what I just used. And the way, the way it manifests, and I do think we saw this from Walker in the first two games, is largely on your decisions on when to play forward, when do you break a line, and when do you swing to your other center back. And that there were a couple times when Walker did not get that decision right in those first two games where he'd try and break a line and it got picked off. Or he would decided to swing when perhaps you could have broken a line or played into the depth. So that for me is the primary decision. And I did think Walker looked shaky, so I can understand the, the adjustment for this game. I agree. And I would say credit to Walker for coming off the bench then and playing at the level he did. And it was different, but man, you put that guy in the middle of a back five and you play balls in the air. He's, he's a stud. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hungry, hungry hippo time. He's a monstrosity. And, and in fairness to him, Tim Ream and, and Carter Vickers at that point lost a decent amount of their battles. And so he was necessary in that moment. Ream and Carter Vickers defensively were incredible for 60 minutes of this game like talk all you want about in possession what they dealt with with Osmoon and Taremi and how simple it was for them and how quickly they could win the ball back and get it back there was not nervous moments where for the U.S. they go down 1-0 it's a whole new game and none of that existed I think that's credit to both of them and Carter Vickers for stepping in and being able to play at that level his first time in the World Cup Reem has played now this full stretch with a yellow card has not picked up a second one which is also really impressive Tim Ream, um, Tim Ream at this point has an argument for best defender in the tournament. I mean, the U.S. is tied with pretty much right behind Brazil with best defense, and right? he has been the best defender. All right, Doyle, you convinced me. It took you a very long time, but you got me there. 2010 Red Bulls forever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hans Bach, as Hans Bach has said, <laughs> his future is there. Bobby? I just wanted to add one part about this game, which I I don't know if the word, if ironic or the right word to summarize it, but I thought the two not defining parts that happened, right. Were the mid block, basically a four, four, two mid block from Burhalter. And then how did the goal come? What was the main pass on the goal? The, 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 yeah, it was the diagonal to the over. It was, it, it was the ball is wide. It's played 15 yards back to a center midfielder, really a defensive midfielder in that moment. The defensive midfielder picks up their head and plays the ball along diagonal to the attacking outside back on the on the far post. And that there have been a lot of progressions over the last three years with Greg Berhalter, a lot of adjustments. And I thought that the that the main game that they will that he will have in charge of this team, the fact that the two things that probably won them the game were the were the the basics, the fundamentals that he came into this team with. Let's let's talk about Greg Moore here because we've waxed poetic about a lot of things. Um, It was his job to get the U S from where they were on the men's side to where they are now. And this is the, this was the expectation and not a single second of it was easy, including his hiring process and the perception around his hiring and the knowledge or lack thereof from a lot of people around what his successes have been and the way he coaches And then you add in all of the challenges since then, both of building a new program, setting a record for debuts of players over the course of a cycle, playing the youngest team 
window in and window out through World Cup qualifying, having a shifted qualifying and COVID and all of that as, as we brought up at the top of the show and trying to build a culture out of nothing from a young group. And it all came through the last three, four years. And Bobby, he qualified. He won the Nations League over Mexico. He won the Gold Cup over Mexico. And now he's qualified for the round of 16. If Greg Berhalter never coaches another game for the U.S. men's national team, that was his checklist coming in. And we now have to give him his plaudits for what he's accomplished. Yeah. Listen, I obviously know Greg um, outside of just this and just soccer. So I acknowledge that I will have confirmation bias when it comes to parts of him. But you just read off his resume as head coach of this team. And I don't know how you can argue with that. And then from a soccer side, when you look at the way this team has played and granted a big part of this conversation depends on where you're starting it and the premises you come in with on based on the, the talent and the quality of the team. I'm probably at a different side of that spectrum than other people are, because I do think that there has been a lot of praise and expectation before there's been much of a sample for it yet. But regardless of where you are, if you look down at the list that you want from a coach, right? If you look at the intensity and the focus that they bring, that's been a check in this tournament. And that's absolutely been a check in every big game that they've played. When you look at the ideas that they bring, does it look like the 11 players have a sense of what they're supposed to do in the different phases? That's a check. And that's probably a check plus compared to what we see from any other national teams, right? We always talk about how it's a simple sport at the national level. You need to keep it basic with your group. And from what we've seen over the three games for for two games for everyone and three games for some teams, this U.S. men's national team is more advanced in their ideas. And then you say, can they execute it? Are they on the same page? Because we've heard this a thousand times about how at the national team level, you do not have enough time to work with a group, which is almost certainly probably been wrong this whole time and just a lack of actually looking back at history. But either way, it's proven wrong with this group and that they do work and execute together. So that's a check. And then the last part is the, the question mark, right? How are they doing and actually creating chances? How are they doing at the part that really the whole part of it, which is getting results? And that is still a a TBD on this, right? Because we can praise the performances. We can praise the minute details of how they go through their rest defense and their phases. But ultimately, this is a team, the United States men's national team, that should be at the round of 16, that should be beating Iran, that should be beating Wales based on all the different uh, factors that would go into those things. And this is still the the to be determined and the exciting part because it really puts stakes on the line. I appreciate that you applauded the team. I appreciate you guys are energized, but we the team should be going into this round of 16 game with the expectation that they can beat a weaker Netherlands side right now. So I'll still put a to be determined on that next part of fully getting the results in the meaningful games. I think it's I think that's fair to want more and Agreed. to push for more. And I think that's a lot of people. I would like to state, though, at this moment, Greg Berhalter is one win away from being unquestionably the most successful manager in U.S. men's national team history. If he gets to a quarterfinal and you add on to that, without question, the other trophies, he's there, right? There's no, oh, well, you haven't won Gold Cup. That does matter once you get to that. And if he gets to a quarterfinal, equals Bruce Arena at that level, the resume from the numbers side will stand alone.